welcome to Webinar Wednesday. That was supposed to be a scary voice. I hope that you are all terrified at this point. But welcome to Webinar Wednesday here at Lulu. I am so glad that you decided to spend time with us today. And I hope that whatever time it is where you are hailing from, that you are having a wonderful day, morning, noon, or night. Um, we've got a very special presentation today, and I'm really, really excited to get into it. So you can see that I am not alone. I am joined by a couple co-hosts today. So Dave Lawrence and Stephen Brotherstone are with me today. They are the co-authors of The Scarred for Life, Volume 1 and 2. I'm very excited because they have very generously offered us a little bit of time in their very busy schedules to talk a little bit about their book and what inspired them and the process they went through to create this book and other opportunities that have come to them from those books. So I am so glad that they are here and I appreciate all of you being here. So thank you to Paul for starting off the chat. Let us know where you're from. Um, are you a fan of 70s and 80s pop culture in the UK? <laughs> Let us know if you are afraid or if you're afraid, if you're a fan of the scary pop culture that you grew up with and that they are featuring in their books and if you've heard of the books. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the interview. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the Q&A tab. We will pick them up at the end. And I think that we are ready to go ahead and get started with this. Are, are you guys ready? Yeah, ready? Ready. prepared. Okay, let's go. All right, let's do it. All right, well, let's just start out with a little bit of an introduction, so we can get some background and tell the people a little bit a little bit about yourselves. Uh, Dave, do you want to start us off? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Dave Lawrence. I am. I always say I'm 21 and a bit. <laughs> I'm actually 58, uh, and I grew up with these uh, scary pop culture of the 70s and 80s. Uh, I teach maths uh, originally, and thanks to staying politicians we have i am now the co-writer of scarred for life and that's led to an awful lot of things for me and i'm really pleased about that me <laughs> i am stephen brotherstone um, i'm 53 so i'm a a, a mere duckling compared to a dave's 58. <laughs> thanks, 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 born in 1970 which is the absolute perfect year for the the things we write about um i kind of drifted through life up until about in my 20s i um started working in forbidden planet which is a famous chain of comic and toy shops in britain spent 20 odd years there that's how i got to know day um i'm now an illustrator scarred for life which changed my life what became a hobby became something that's just exploded as dave said we've got a podcast we do live comedy shows other things we can't even talk about and mm -hmm. a, a list of books that will probably take us into the next decade i think i think that's right to say dave things oh, beyond the scarred for life trilogy so yeah. this little self-published hobby literally life-changing yeah and i wanted to talk to you a little bit about that so i've been at lulu for about six years now and i remember hearing about your book or just seeing it because it was selling really well and it so it came across my radar so Take me back to pre-2017, before you published Volume 1, and tell me about how did you guys discover your interest in this, or how did you discover you both had an interest in it, and how did that become the book that it became? Well, I, as I said, I worked at Forbidden Planet for 20 odd years, and Dave was basically, before, even before I worked there, he was kind of one of our first customers, and when a regular customer comes in every week, they become a friend of the shop, and eventually they just become a friend. So we'd make cups of tea of a morning for us, the staff, to wake up. But we'd make cups of tea for Dave, who would bring biscuits in. And he'd stay yeah. for a couple of hours. We'd have a chat, um, talk about what was on at the telly. We had the, exactly the same tastes in science fiction, horror, TV shows. So we bonded over that, big Star Trek fans, Doctor Who fans. And as far as the things that we write about it's just in the fabric of british culture for our generation generation x everyone grew up with this stuff everyone you didn't even have to be a science fiction or horror or fantasy fan you just had to plonk yourself in front of the telly at kind of four or five o'clock in the evening and you would soak all this stuff up everyone bought black and white british comics it was just a part of everyone's childhood most people would grow out of it but me and dave were that section of <laughs> society that never grew out of it so 
we're having a conversation in work one day. This is 2014, and there's me, Dave, and my mate and colleague, Col. And it was one of those quiet mornings where we're kind of saying those things like, oh, do you remember this TV show? Do you remember that film? Oh, do you remember that comic? Do you remember those sweets? And eventually like, we get a delivery, and unfortunately me and Col have to get back to work. And I couldn't shift this conversation out of my head all day because everything we talked about, literally, without exception, was violent, shocking, wholly inappropriate for children. Most of it was aimed at children. And I wanted to write, read the book that someone had obviously written about the dark side of 70s and 80s pop culture, the stuff we grew up with. So I went home and scoured Amazon, Waterstones, every website I could find. Millions of books about growing up in the 70s and 80s, but none about the dark side. So I went into work the next day, he was telling me to make a call about it, and he just went, well, you like writing, why don't you write it? And I laughed in his face, because I'm, I'm not a professional writer, but I couldn't shift the idea. So on the way home, I bought a notebook and started making notes. I started making lists of things to write about and just went for it. But a week later, by, uh, within that week, I realized what a gargantuan task this is. It was originally going to be one book encompassing everything. So the next time I saw Dave, I said, yeah, you, you've always been into writing. Do you, do you fancy just as a hobby, just as a lack? Do you want to write this book? Obviously, he said, yes, Dave, you can take over. This is where you can. Yeah, well, as he said, we had these conversations. Uh, and, we, we, this, and this is over a period of years. This isn't just like one conversation. This is a period of years where we talk about these things. Um, and when Steve said, do you want to work? It's like, yeah, but I think we have a very clear idea of the tone we wanted from those conversations. Our books, hopefully, are conversational. You know, the things we do, everything we do with it is conversational. And that's what we wanted because nostalgia programs in, in this country, in the UK, tend to be, to remember this, or you'd have 20 something comedians who you've never heard of who, who laugh at these old TV shows, these old wonky TV shows. And, old films it's wobbly set but we never did that our conversations were always very respectful love, even loving towards the stuff uh, we were talking about so when steve said do you want to write this book with me it was like definitely and and i think because we had a, we were on the same page as regards term as regards what we wanted to do with it i think I said, yeah fine um three and a half very long years later uh the first book came out um i think yeah and I think what we said, because we, we didn't, I think the important thing we found out was that other people had the same experiences as us. Mm -hmm. We had a conversation when Steve was about to hit the publish button. And Steve said to me, he says, do you know what? If we sell 300 books in my lifetime, I'll be delighted. I'll be, I'll, and I was a wide, so wild-eyed, wide-eyed, wild-haired optimist who said, let's do a thousand, let's do a thousand books. We reached Steve's target on day one. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, we reached Steve's target. My, my lifetime target in <laughs> one day. One. So uh, you're yeah, retired uh, now, I guess, then, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, doing this, I'm doing this recording on my private Caribbean island, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing this one from my volcano base. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Yeah, but I think, but that's the see that's the thing. We, I think we found when when the when the books came out, we found that because we'd been very true to our tone, we had a tone we wanted, uh, and the reason I think we came to Lulu was because we could publish the book we wanted to to publish. You know what I mean? We could it would be what we wanted uh, with no regard to you know what anybody else would think about it. Uh, but it found its audience and it's done phenomenally well. We always wrote the book that we wanted to read. Yeah, absolutely. that was the thing. There's a there's a cliche in Britain. It's a very British thing. I'm a massive music fan as well. I used to read um, the music weeklies, the music press, when I was in, an indie kid, as they call it over here in indie music. Young indie bands would always use this term. We just recorded the album we wanted to hear. And if mm. anyone else likes it, that's a bonus. And that's what me and Dave lived by. This yeah. is the books we wanted to read. As it turns out, 17,000 other people wanted to read it as well. At, at, That's at moment, very impressive. 
I, well, that's so, one of the things that I always loved about your origin story or what I had heard is that you love this topic. You were looking for a book about it and then couldn't find it. So you decided to write it and, and create what you wanted to read. And the fact that it found such a fandom, such a following is just so spectacular. But when you were writing it, so those three years before launching the book, how do you kind of give yourself the permission to work on something when there is no guaranteed outcome? I mean, I know you kind of set these goals of 300 or a thousand copies, but I'm sure there were times in that process where you were thinking, you know, is this worth it? Should I be doing something else that I'm going to get some actual money for immediately? So how do you kind of keep going in those times? I, I don't think we cared about the outcome at that point. I don't think we absolutely not, cared at all. not at all. It wasn't we, even we, a consideration, I, was it? Then? Yeah. And I, th I think if we'd have thought about it, if we'd have thought, what are people going to want to buy, then we would have instantly been making compromises with ourselves. Mm. We, would have been, yeah. we would have been writing something for somebody else. We weren't doing that. We were writing it for ourselves. I think the first time you put pen to paper or you know, fingers to keyboard or whatever, I think you're about to write something that nobody's seen before. So I think that has to be authentic to yourself. It has to be something says something about you i think and i think you find your audience by being genuine about it i mm -hmm. think if we tr because if we'd have gone to a publisher with the book they would have looked at the stuff that was in it and they would have said that's popular keep that in i've never heard of that get rid mm -hmm. and it turns out that the stuff that people love is the stuff you've never heard of the, the things they're finding through us uh so like i say we stayed true to what we wanted and uh, we found an audience and there's a guy, basically. the guy that writes the intros for all three of our books, the, he's written the intro for volume three, which is kind of 60%, 70% complete at the moment, called Johnny Mains. And he's a, he's a basically a horror editor, horror author in Britain. He's a Scottish guy. He's an encycl a walking encyclopedia of horror. And he basically called me and Dave mad very early on. He said, you're both mad. He said, I can tell you're not professional authors. I, I said, why? He said, because if you were professionals and you had a business brain, basically all our books are segregated. There's, there's big chapters on television, films, comics, the paranormal, sweets and crisps, uh, everything that kids were into, teenagers were into, to do with the Scarred for Life era. He said, if you had a business brain, if you were professionals, you would have split that into six books and made loads more money. But we didn't want to do that. We wanted to give value for money. 740 pages for volume one. 550 for volume two and there's going to be another 740 for volume three but everything you need is in one book yes. so you guys are definitely testing the limits yeah well i mean yeah, I, looking at these tomes that you've created i mean 740 pages for the first one 550 pages for the second one i mean when you were looking at your content how did you narrow it down or was it just everything that we were interested in is going into it? And then I also just wanted to ask you about the research process for this book. I mean, when do you get to the point where you say we've done enough research, we're, we're done, we're ready to create this book and, and go to the presses, if you will? Well, again, we, the way we do it, we, we don't know how to do this thing. We were just, <laughs> me and Dave were winging it. We were winging it, weren't we, right? Yeah, Basically, absolutely. so I, I, start, I start making those lists for a week, so I'm kind of scouring the internet and my collection of TV and horror and cult magazines for ideas of, obviously, the TV shows and the comics that we grew up with and the games and the toys, everything. The intention originally was to just do one book to cover the 70s and 80s, and one of the first conversations me and Dave had was, well, do we do this year by year, or do we do it subject by subject, and obviously subject by subject is, was a nicer format. And very early on, we realized the, the one book we wanted to make it be about 3,000 pages long, <laughs> it'd be bigger than the Bible. So then we thought, right, one book for the 70s, one book for the 80s, perfect. So we're kind of doing these expansive lists that we're kind of whittling down. And even as we're writing the books, we're discovering more and more subjects, more shows that we think, we can't really leave this out. So the plans are shifting constantly. As for research, we do it as we go along. I, we kind of write it piece by piece. This is the thing, Dave, I, you'll talk about this, how it was almost like we were bagsian. I want to write about that. I want to write about yeah. that. That means a yeah. lot to me. So yeah, that, that kind of separation process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as, as for research, um, my, my basic advice for that was be, 
to read it yourself or see it yourself or do it yourself because it might be hard to believe but there's an awful lot of nonsense on the internet uh, that isn't true. Uh, uh, I know, it's incredible, but there you go. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, if I wrote about a TV show, I watched it. If I wrote about a film, I watched it. If I, you know, a book, I read it. Uh, and I think that was important um, because, and I also, another thing I did, was I didn't give anybody else's opinions on things because I was always aware that my brain might spit something back out and be complained to by somebody else. Uh, I didn't want to do that. So I avoided other people's discussions of things. So I'd, I'd read original uh, original newspaper articles on something, or I'd read. What was really great was obituaries. <laughs> if I found out somebody was doing it, yes, he dead. That's <laughs> off, that can find me a bit. <laughs> Yeah, a big thing for me was unexpected. Uh, yeah, there's there's a website called Hansard, which is basically the the archive of every government discussion or whenever they have a vote, the entire transcripts, someone transcripts everything in the House of Commons, and a lot of these things because they were very controversial. The Hansard website will have MPs, politicians, debating TV shows whether they're oh, suitable for children and really toys and games. Fun. So we, we, the biggest thing we did, the biggest decision we made was, as Dave said, a lot of these TV shows that deal with the things we write about in Britain are very, um, they look down their nose at them. And the books that I've got about growing up in the 70s and 80s tend to say, do you remember this toy? Oh, do you remember this comic? And I kind of read it going, well, yeah, I do. Well, could you tell me how it was made? I want to know the story behind the story. So as far as possible, we went deep into everything, not just how things were made, but very early on, we realized we were telling the social history of Great Britain in the 1970s and 80s through pop culture, because we had some quite famous sitcoms in the 70s that were racist. I mean, late, the N word, everything at like nine o'clock in the evening. My mum and dad weren't racist at all, but they would laugh uproariously. So one of the, the sections of volume one is, dealing with the fact that these things were wrong mm -hmm. but what did it say about british society the fact that this was prime time entertainment mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's yeah, interesting I, I, that oh i'm sorry go ahead dave sorry. i was just gonna say yes what steve said i'd always find like a real world hook for something i was writing about so if i wrote about a police series i'd find about like real world policing at the time and so forth and mm -hmm. so i could connect it up because obviously these programs weren't made in a vacuum yeah these things uh and they've been informed by Pop, the you know the news at the time so yeah as he said it became a history of britain in the 70s and 80s purely by chance yeah i think whenever you look at this and you think it's a really niche topic like the horror genre or the or the terrifying things you're seeing in the 70s and 80s and then when you're doing this research and then to discover that it's actually a commentary on what was going on then and how people mm. were thinking and and a you know a, a kind of commentary on the media that was acceptable at that time and and being able to have a critical eye on it. So that's maybe something that you didn't expect going into it. But what else, as you were kind of going through this process of collecting this information and starting the publishing process, what else did you learn that you kind of didn't expect or, yeah, that, that was sort of unknown to you before you started the process? Well, um, what didn't I expect? Um, I didn't expect it's a connect so personally to me. I think that's, I think, I, what I found out, I mean, because I just thought I'm gonna write about a funny TV show, or I'm gonna write about a documentary, I'm gonna write about a film. And as I went on, I mean, the, the 80s book in particular, I think it connects far more with me as a person at that time than I expected it to. Like one of the pieces I wrote for the second volume, it's about my local uh, waste disposal uh, tip. Um, and about going down there and in where I live, where I live then, where I live now, in the 80s, uh, unemployment was a very serious problem. And we'd go to the tip and there'd be people on the tip uh, picking through rubbish, finding something to barter or sell, and in some cases even eat. So it, it became, I think what, what surprised me about writing the books is it became a very personal journey through some quite difficult times that I'd experienced. and my environment and experience at the time. So I think that's what I'd say. That's for me, actually, that's a good question. I, I, do you know what? I don't know what, I think the same thing as Dave, really, because, yeah, we had the intention of just writing a, not an academic book, 
a very expansive for a book, but a very people always say it fe- reading our books feels like talking to your mate down at the pub, the same kind of conversation that spawned the books. But they're not autobiographical, but we put so much autobiographical stuff in it. The stuff like my mum died in 1990, but I always equate that with kind of there's a certain TV shows and films that were on the television that day and the day after that I can't dislodge in my head. Mm-hmm. And like we said, we wrote volume one from the point of view of little kids, which we were in the 70s. So the things we write about is kind of more horror and sci-fi related. It's ghosts, it's UFOs and outright horror on television. The 1980s book or the first 1980s book is when we become teenagers and things are real. And that's when, like they said, we find we're putting more and more of our life experiences into it. So there's unemployment, there's AIDS, there's the heroin epidemic in Britain. The big one in volume three, we basically, the 1980s was such a huge subject. We split that into two books. The night, the, the third Scott Flight book will be the other half of the 1980s, the stuff that isn't just television. The volume three is going to have a book within a book that's just about nuclear war and Cold War related pop culture because that loomed over us every day for two or three years. I thought I was going to get blown up. So it's the thing that didn't we didn't expect is it's brought back all these autobiographical anecdotes and memories and we're just soaking it up and putting ourselves into it, which we, we didn't think we were going to do. It was just going to be yeah. writing about ventriloquist dolls and stuff, which has been a nice surprise. <laughs> That doll scared me, Steve, okay? That doll scared me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Obviously, it's still scarred, still scarred from some of that <laughs> stuff. But let's go back to the first book and talk to me a little bit about once you had published it and got that first copy in your hands, after all those years of work and all those years of being scarred and then being able to revisit it and write about it, what did that feel like and what did that mean for y'all to hold it in your hands and actually have the tangible representation of this passion project? It was incredible. It was, weirdly enough, I thought the feeling would dull because I was so excited about it that constantly along the way, I must have ordered about 10 proof copies from 20 pages to 50 pages to 100. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to see what it felt like, what how it was coming together. And I was always excited every time another 50 pages were added, I'd order myself a proof copy. And I thought maybe that would, by the time the actual book's finished, I'd be like, well, at least it's finished. But I still remember the package coming to work at the time and open it up and it was just a, such a life moment. I was like, it's finished. If this is my book, this is our book, mine and Dave's books. This is what yeah. we've been working for for three and a half years. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And it, and it was really heavy. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, I've seen your books. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They're tomes, like I said. <laughs> yeah, well, One of the reviews, those were the best review I've ever seen or the funniest basically said, for volume one said it's unputdownable, but it's also unpickupable. <laughs> it's just it's, it's like a brick. <laughs> yeah, that's something that maybe you guys didn't intend that if you do read this book and maybe you read it daily, your biceps will be massive at the end of it. You can definitely use this <laughs> yeah. for some curls. So a mental and physical workout, if you will. Uh, so when you guys were working on this, and so you kind of talked about the success of the first book when you when you made the book available for sale, but how did you tap into the community of fans for this project? I mean, how did you find those people? Obviously, working in the comic shop helps, but how did you connect with those people? And did you just tell them, hey, we're working on this, you know, as during that three year process? Or what did that look like for you? It was Twitter. Basically, yeah. I started the Twitter account in 2014. Um, so they come up to 10 years next year. And that was the, the big impetus. I, I started Twitter and Facebook and Facebook was ticking along, but Twitter was insane because of the way Twitter was built around retweets. Within about a month, I think there was a couple of hundred followers because someone somewhere will see, like you follow someone, they follow you back. But because the retweet system means that all their followers see the tweets. So it was building steadily, went around the Twitter till I think it was 2017, 2018 even after the first book had come out, it was built into thousands. I think there's about 7,000 followers by the time the first book was out. So it was a proper little community. There's loads of people that I grew to know and who have grown to know as real life friends okay. on from Twitter. But I remember, in, I think it was February, 2018, 
I tweeted about an advert that was around, kind of famous advert in Britain in the late 80s for British pork, which is the most innocuous thing ever. <laughs> Just to say, eat pork. But the advert, in hindsight, looks like a cannibal family. It's this incredibly intense dad carving up meat and really kind of, Fred's got plenty, Arthur's got plenty, my wife's got plenty. And there's a real strange serial killer vibe about him. So I tweeted that. It, I, I basically went out for the day and went to the Tate Gallery in, in town to look at some art. And I thought people were, were phoning me constantly. It was notifications come up. It went viral and it got about 3,000 followers in two days because of the retweets. And that's where the mm. American community started because <clears throat> Americans are going, what the hell is wrong with your country? <laughs> so it's social media. Social media is absolutely vital. Dave took over the Facebook uh, yeah. thing and grew from 2,000 followers to, what is it, Dave, 14? I think it's 14,000 now, yeah. Wow. Wow. I think, I think what it is, it's, it's, it's putting out content every day or as near to every day as you can get. I'll tell you one thing we did, I think, that made a difference as well. We took a copy of our book to our local BBC radio station and, and gave it to a DJ. And we got, from that, we got an interview on the radio, on the local radio, which was BBC there. Um, and we talked for half an hour, we were on for five minutes total, I think. But I think that started us on the path of, of being more visible on a, on a wider scale as well, I think. And, and then we got another interview on BBC Radio Tees and, and uh, the guy who interviews Bob Fisher said, do you want to come up and talk about uh, your book? We were trying to talk about your book. So we went back to Radio Midnight, went and talked to BBC Radio Tees. Again, that a couple million audience. Um, and then from that, we started our live shows. And I think it, was, it just it just expanded basically as we, we just. Well, I think the key was as as these you know, content always putting out content always sometimes being ruthlessly self promotional. I think, but you know, just just content. Yeah, and always engaging. There's always it's yeah. never a corporate type Facebook or Twitter account. It's it's me. I can't be serious to save me life. So it's always talking and replying to people. And Dave does the yeah. same on Facebook. It's yeah. It's engaging with the audience. Like I say, I've, I've made friends on Twitter. It's been beautiful. It's a proper scarred for life community, which is lovely. And, and, we, um, and we do. Oh. Sorry, we, we do see that we do see people coming to show after show. I mean, Paul Charles, uh, Paul, uh, oh, he Paul. comes to our he comes to our shows, uh, and it's much appreciated. <laughs> but we see we do love yeah. we do love that we love the fact that we have this community has grown and grown and grown. I and see now so, have over sixty thousand followers on Twitter. So that's amazing. Yeah, your social media presence is incredibly impressive. And so, when are you guys going to break into TikTok? No, well, I don't, I, 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 I can't I, dance I did, to save me life. <laughs> I've been practicing my saucy dances all week, you know, but it's not there. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, you've done pretty well on the platforms you're on, so no need to uh, <laughs> to break it if it or break it if it's not broke. I don't know, I can't even remember the term. Okay, all right, so I wanted to talk to you, you touched a little bit about this on your interviews that you've gotten, but um, so tell me a little bit about what the book has become since you published the first one and other opportunities that have come out of it. So you touched a little bit on the radio interviews, obviously, but tell me a little bit more about what has come of the book outside of the actual physical book and the sales of it. It's crazy because obviously the reason we chose the name Scarred for Life is it's a famous, well-used saying in Britain, I'm sure everywhere. That program scarred me for life. Oh, yes. that comic scarred me for life. But scarred for life has now become a phrase of its own in relation to us. There's people with add us in for tweets in relation to not just that phrase, but specifically us. But it's become huge. Basically, we've Dave said we're doing the live comedy shows. And the podcast is the big thing at the moment. We've talked about this for two or three years. Me and Dave invested in podcasting microphones this, the Christmas before last but life always got in the way but luckily a radio DJ over here got in contact through Twitter and said love the Twitter account love the books have you thought about doing a podcast and I was like well actually yeah we have but we've just not had the time to do it and he was like right we're doing it so he gave us the kick up the bum that we needed mm. and this is the mad thing we've always resisted the whole influencer thing but with 61,000 followers on Twitter and 14 on Facebook, we, we kind of are. We've got celebrity followers. And the podcast format is that we interview a different celebrity every week. 
and they bring with them three childhood scars, three things that scarred them for life when they were kids. But we had this wish list of people to ask on the podcast, and it went from people aren't necessarily famous, but they're very they're well known within certain circles, or people who created this stuff that we, we talk about, right up to proper celebrities. And pretty much everyone said yes, including people like Michael Sheen is going to be on series two next year. So we're flabbergasted oh, by the response. There's an exclusive. We're not supposed to talk about that, but there's an exclusive. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, hopefully you'll do it. But yeah. like, big stars. And it, there's a project that we still... It's, basically, if this comes up, the sky's the limit. But there's a, we had a meeting on Zoom two weeks ago. And we can't the, talk about it. If it, we can't <laughs> talk about it, but it's insane it, what's come from it. And there's another thing, isn't it, Steve, that we can't talk about? <laughs> oh, God, yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. There's a few things we can't talk about. We can't talk about. A, and on top of that, at the centre of it all is always the books. It's mm -hmm. all about the books. And we've got this list of future projects, and we know the order they're going to come in. Um, I guess this is the we can talk about we can talk about the list, can't we, David? Just yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this the time to talk about the future projects, Chelsea? Yes, yes, yeah, let's yeah, do it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, so next year is Scarred Life Volume Three, and that's the end of that trilogy. Mm -hmm. We're not doing a '90s book because we were too old. For me, the 1990s is this big ten-year-long party. We survived the '80s. We got through it. So people were just off their heads on drugs and drink for the <laughs> 1990s and Britain. No scars to be had. But we will probably do a 1960s prequel, like, like book zero at yeah. some point. Mm -hmm. But after volume three is the Scarred for Life book of horror stories, which is two short story horror anthologies inspired by the Scarred for Life era, the TV shows, the public information films, the games, everything we grew up on. Um, one book for the 70s, one for the 80s, and we've already got a list of contributors that we want, and loads of people have already said yeah. So nice little short story books. Then after that, we're going to do a retro annual. Mm. Now, there's a, a tradition which still happens in Britain, which has been stretching back decades. Every August, every comic, every pop star, every TV show, every film, they would release a hardback colour annual for, for the Christmas market in Britain. And these annuals were treasured. You'd rip over your wrapping paper and you'd get your Spider-Man annual or your Doctor Who annual. So we're doing a Scarred for Life annual with comic strips and short stories and puzzles and the style of those old annuals. Again, dealing with everything that we write about, we're going to do a, a, a Scarred for Life book of the paranormal, which isn't going to be investigating this stuff. But we want to talk about the way the paranormal has been dealt with on television in all media, print media from the 60s through to now. Um, a book about music. Um, God, there's so much stuff. There's a couple beyond that, like say, volume zero. Yeah, what it's endless. There's, 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 yeah, it's yeah. endless. There's so, there's so much stuff you can do with it. It's just, it's just, and because. And the big the, thing is, it's it's all passion projects. It's all stuff yeah. you want to do. Yeah, exactly. And, and and because we've essentially invented our own niche, you know, we're the only ones doing this. So it's you know, it's, uh, it's really good. No, it's amazing to see how much work you've done and how much you want to do and that you're still enjoying it. And so you guys have cracked the code if you're able to do that and then make some money on it as well. And that's yeah, that's that's what everyone's trying to do. Um, so I will go ahead. I'm going to take a couple questions from the audience. They dropped in the Q&A. If you all have any more, just drop them in the Q&A tab and we will get to them if we can. So Chloe is asking, what advice would you give to someone who loves reading and writing, really wants to dedicate to writing a book, but is nervous to start? Oh, just do it. This yeah. is the thing with Lulu. No, seriously, just do it. There's no, there's no risk. There's no financial outlay. It's not like Kickstarter. If I wanted, if me and Dave wanted to make, say, a Scarred for Life board game on Kickstarter, we have to produce a fully professional prototype to show potential backers. Lulu, write your book. Get someone to design your cover. There's no risk. What's the, yeah. worst that, the worst thing that can happen is five people buy it. The best thing that can happen is 20,000 people buy it. Mm -hmm. Just do it. I, yeah, Honestly. I'd say just write. I'd say, I'd just say, just, just sit down, write, and it doesn't matter what you write. Just flex those muscles, exercise, the, exercise your brain, get going, see what comes out, see what and happens. And write it for yourself. Write, write it for you, actually, yeah, as we said before, Chloe, write it for yourself. Don't, yeah, don't, yeah, Chloe, don't, don't write for anybody else. Don't write for... 
you know, write through what you'd want to read, write for what you'd want to see in print, and be nope, true to yourself. That's it. Don't don't worry about what anyone else might think. Yeah, exactly. Just, I mean, and, and don't judge anybody else already. Yeah, you know, just 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 write and enjoy the writing. That's what I'd say. Yeah, I think that's good advice and removes all of your excuses that you might have for not doing it. So just write, just do it. So thank you for that question, Chloe. All right, Nick is saying the books are huge. How did you even begin to research or remember everything? Are there things you remember, but you've been unable to find information about? Oh, good question. Oh, yeah, that's right. There's, yeah, there's, uh, there's, 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 we've had some holy grails, don't we? There's, there's some holy grails you want to see. There's, uh, is, yeah. is, the is the escalator with the um, the dog getting chewed up? If that's one of them. It's a yeah, yeah. It's like a warning. It's a warning to kids about not standing too close to the edge of the escalator because you get chewed up by the escalator. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, um, there's uh, so one thing we want to see that does exist, but we can't afford to see it. Is the Hexham Heads, which is a nationwide report about these stone heads that they found in the garden, and uh, that's the thing we want to see. But there's, yeah, there's, well. A voyage of continual discovery about things we didn't remember from the time. So, I mean, one of the things on our list of to do could easily be uh, a volume seventies redux, a, a volume two. The 70s That's what we thought about, hasn't it? Because yeah. we split the eighties into two, we had to mm. chuck out so much stuff for the seventies book. And now I'm thinking, oh, really regret it. So, if there's one thing, the one thing, well, one of the things we learnt is, if we could go back and do it again, we'd do the seventies in two books. Like really yeah. give it the attention it deserves. As far as research goes, it's just an ongoing learning process. I mean, people always say we're the experts now for this stuff. The fact is, if if we do a podcast or we do any appearance, we have to have reams of notes, or I do, because mm. there's so much information that we've researched over the years. I can't remember these dates. I can't remember these names. I'm like Homer Simpson, where one item of information pushes the other one out. But it's true. We are technically, as, for the expansive subject of the whole of the dark side of the 70s and 80s, I guess me and Dave are the experts. Just I just wing it, Dave. I just wing it. I don't yeah, I just <laughs> wing it. But, but this is the thing with research and the internet's the number one thing. It's you, you learn how to scour and go below the surface and find mm -hmm. insane, like Dave said, obituaries, Hansard tiny little websites on page 45 of your search results then you've got your magazines if you can this is the thing we live in liverpool and the world so we can't afford to go to like there's places like the bfi anywhere down south is out of our reach because that would be a treasure trove but we've learned how to how to research our yeah I, th I think one thing that was that's very useful is in in britain if you join a local library you get access to the newspaper archives uh, and, you go, and you can look at, online, you can look at the newspaper archives, and that's a mm -hmm. phenomenally useful resource uh, for things, for, for like opinions of things at the time where they, they were. Even transmission dates that you, we found out. There's mm -hmm. a thing that Dave discovered through the writing that we did about children's TV shows in the 70s, mm -hmm. and Dave named it the 445 Club. Now, in Britain, children's television used to start kind of 10 to 3, uh, 10 to 4, 4 o'clock and would go through to half past five when you get a new show up, a soap opera that would lead to new shows and then the evening schedule would begin. And they've discovered that the start of children's programming would be programs that called Sooty and Sweet or Michael Benteen's Potter Dam, programs for very young viewers through to 4.45, 4.50 in the, evening, in the afternoon, when you would suddenly, with no warning, be hit with these hard hitting dramas that would be, there's one called Noah's Castle from 1980, which is about, about hyperinflation in Britain, which causes food riots, food banks. It's heavily implied that schoolgirls are prostituting themselves. They're selling their bodies to buy food for their families. This is a children's drama. Yeah, for the kids. What, for the kids. One of my <laughs> favorites from, one of my favorites from 1975 was called The Feathered Serpent, which is an Aztec drama. It's set in ancient Mexico times. It's really complex it's a very uh, religious and political drama about an emperor that worships a a new god that um, kind, of, kind of practices benevolence and kindness and a priest that worships an old god that wants human sacrifice now there's beatings and stabbings and blood running down people's backs and spears in the side and 
at one point there's a human sacrifice scene that shows a close-up of a knife touching skin, then touch it, it cuts to reaction scenes of people looking horrified, and a long shot of a human heart in a chalice, 4.45 in the afternoon to children. For the kids. Yeah, for kids. Probably. Because there was no regard for whether or not these things were suitable for kids. It was just like, it's fun, so let's bung it on. But we only found this out through research and transmission times, through newspaper, or they found it out. Yeah. Through being able to access these things. Yeah, I think that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that sounds very you're, different. You're than... complete. You're completely speechless. There. Yeah, I'm like, I'm trying to think, man, when I was having my milk and cookies after school, do I remember the human sacrifice episode of, you know, Hey Arnold? <laughs> I don't. They, they had taken that off air, I guess. So, no. <laughs> and I guess, you know, when you're researching a book like this, you have to go past the first page of your Google search results to to get to get the good stuff. So thank you for that answer. And Nick, thank you for that question. All right. And Paula is asking, could you describe your writing process? So you talked a lot about the research and what goes into it. But, you know, you talked about how you kind of became a little bit more self-reflexive in your writing process. But talk to us a little bit about what that looks like for y'all. Uh, my writing process isn't very structured, I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, you know, I, I don't tend to go from A to B to C. I tend to go from F to Z to Q to uh, and avoid A for as long as possible because I find intros the hardest thing to write. So what I will do is I will think of a, a, a line I, I'd, I'd like to write. I think of something, oh, that, that made me smile, I, that, that sounds good. And I'd write that down. I'd be this completely disjointed mess of a thing. And then one day I'll sit down and put it all, hopefully, in order. So my writing process isn't in any way linear and is in no way anything to, to mimic or you know, use as <laughs> the other way of doing it. Mine is the complete opposite to Dave's. It's very strange. But I always say that Dave is the the research master. His, 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 his pieces are incredible. I wouldn't say methodical, but the research that Dave does is incredible. Like the deepest dives, managing to scour these little quotes and gems. And mine is, I would say, more emotional. That's how it made me feel. Mm. The memories that they dredge up. But I would do a lot, a lot of research myself. But my writing style is complete opposite. I go from A to Z, and then I go back again and go through A to Z again. This always surprises people when I say how I write. At the moment, I'm writing a piece for Volume 3 about Clive Barker, the horror mm. novelist and director, who's my favorite horror author. I basically have like 20 tabs open on my browser. I, I do a bit of internet research, so I have like 20 tabs open for what I want to include. But it's generally something that I know a bit about anyway. I just start writing. I go straight in from the intro and just write. And I write blind about what I want to hear when I'm reading this piece about Clive Barker or Doom Lord or whatever TV show. I will just write and I'll refer to me magazines, my research, the internet along the way. But when I finish the piece, I will go back and then I'll refer properly to all the research that I've gathered, all the notes that I've made in my book, and I insert them as I need to in, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. I've basically got the entire picture on the box. And once that's finished, then I go back and I insert facts and quotes as I need to insert them, and then do a final pass and kind of make sure it all reads I, okay. But it's actually very, I, I wing it, I basically just wing it. So, what, what's what's these? Actually, I think I start from a fact and build from there. For example, I'm currently writing about the the 1983 film War Games, Matthew Godric, and I decided to start it. I did. This is where I actually started. I say, um, and I my research involved looking up a weather forecast for Colorado on November the 13th, 1979. Uh, so. so that's the sort of, but that's that's the thing I can I can latch on to as a way to start writing something, you see. So I I think mine's mine start the fact, I think, and then goes from there. So if, again it's the opposite way around today. I don't do it in order, I don't I do I start from the fact that goes from there. Yeah, but I think it's helpful to hear there are different ways to do it, and you guys are able to successfully collaborate and create something really worthwhile. And Paul said, I believe that Grain Chill, another 445 show, was the first children's program to show an on-screen death of a child character. 
when Jeremy drowned in the school pool. So just shout out to my parents for birthing me in the USA. So I didn't have to watch that stuff. So that's my, my, my favorite TV show of all time is the legendary kid show, Grange Hill, ran for decades. Okay. Paul's right, but it was actually before then. <laughs> it was, Ooh, I'm going to okay. show me nerd side now. There was a character, it was late 70s, a, a little boy called Jeremy Karamanopoulos, who was arsing around was it Anthony? at the top of a, what's that? Was it Anthony? Oh, Anthony, sorry, yeah, it was Anthony Karamanopoulos. Yeah. It was I was going to say, I think it's Anthony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, I could see Met, Messing around at a, at a, on a car park, basically fell off a roof and you saw his dead body splayed out on the ground, which was, this is the thing again, they didn't have any regard for yeah. showing dead kids in a kid's show. <laughs> well, I mean, you guys are both alive today, so who knows if that would have been the case if you didn't have those shows to tell you <laughs> well, not to jump yeah. off the roof of a car park or jump in a pool that was too deep. So I guess that's a good thing. So tell we'll me a little bit. Yeah. Well, so I wanted to ask one more thing about your writing process. So obviously you guys are working with huge ranges of information and time spans. How do you schedule this? Do you say, you know, I would, I, we know we want the book to come out this time or now that you have a couple under your belt, do you say, we've done these two, it took this amount of time, so we're gonna give ourselves, you know, a couple years to finish this or, or how does that process work for y'all? It's basically <laughs> one thing we've learned because on my computer are trailers that I've created for volume three and volume two. And sometimes you kind of look at them and go, oh, there it says vo volume three available Christmas 2020 I'm like, <laughs> now we've we've learned basically life's changed for me and Dave Dave's got a three-year-old son mm. there's all kinds of, I'm busy with artwork so we've learned that volume three is finished when it's finished and everything mm. else moving forward is ready when it's ready but it's not to say we're sitting on our thumbs we are hard at work with this stuff mm. but we want to do it right so we've learned not to give ourselves firm deadlines we just know we want it out next year yeah so yeah it's it's that thing of getting it right again we haven't got a publisher breathing down our neck so yeah we can afford to to do that yeah. and of course we can't not mention the other contributors bloody hell we've got like five or six other amazing contributors who help with volume two um andrew and chris orton we've got helen and nash uh johnny mains jez Connolly, neil Oh, God, I can't remember his name, but yeah, we've got amazing other contributors who've helped out who have just, just get it. They just get it instantly. We're not academic. It's about the memories. It's about what we grew up with. Actually, I need to get the names right. It is James Gent, Mark Cunliffe, Neil Mitchell. We, we, without them, volume two, wouldn't have been what it was. But yeah. they, again, we just gave them a list of things that were left that me and Dave we would have written about them, but we weren't that precious about them. Yeah. So they picked and chose things that spoke to them from the list of subjects and they knocked it out of the park. Just brilliant. Mm. So for anyone who is interested in finding or hearing when volume three drops, what's the best place to find you? Is it Twitter or the Facebook group or how, what's the best place to keep up with you guys? Well, both I think also, yeah, I think Twitter and Facebook both will, will be, will be heavily trailing the books coming out when they come out and i run um, the instagram as well every day as well so yeah. it's basically the three big social medias and also, also i think we're going to do again what we did from volume two my my wife alex had a the brilliant idea of using a mailchimp uh, like an email mm -hmm. campaign um and that worked really well that um yeah that that got us a lot of sales of volume two on day one i think over a thousand yeah. sales on day one i think it was for volume two yeah, uh, that's incredible. Quiet about it. And that, and that, and that, was, that was that was also partially down to you, Chelsea, because she gave us the, the bespoke code the, uh, for the people who signed up for the for the emails. You know, so yes. it, that's yeah. a, a big driver of day one traffic for our book. I think so that was good. But when it's ready to go, when it's coming yeah. together, we, we, we will, won't be quiet. We, we, will, will, we won't. We'll be about shouting it. from the rooftop. We'll be shouting from the rooftop. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and I will say I made uh, your code live for today. So anyone watching, if you guys would like to pick up volume one or two to read up and get through the over a thousand pages of content that you need to catch <laughs> up on before volume three <laughs> drops then scar 15 i just dropped it in the chat you can use that on lulu to buy either of the books so uh right around the corner it will be halloween um do you guys have any top 
uh, videos or shows that we should watch to get scarred, get scared, and get in the zone for this Halloween season? Do you want to go first, Dave? Yeah, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, for me, horror films are inextricably linked to my childhood when my mum and dad got a new TV and they gave me their old black and white one. And I was upstairs in my bedroom, bathed in that blue light with the smell of burnt dust in the air, watching <laughs> horror film double bills when I should have been asleep on a, of a Friday or Saturday night. And my choices uh, for Halloween scares are films I saw then. I'm going to pick uh, the portmanteau horror films of Amicus, specifically 1973's Tales from the Tales uh, 1974's Vault of Horror and I think 1975's From Beyond the Grave. And the uh, little short stories based on uh, the American EC comics in the 1950s of the same name. And they saw British actors who are British. They're not particularly scary, not particularly gory. They're just lovely, lovely things. Cozy. Like cozy, cozy. Cozy heart. Cozy heart. I'll give you an example. There's, there's one stars a British comic actor called Kerry Thomas, where he's, he's a neatness freak. And he's always nagging his wife to be very neat and very tidy. And in the end, she hits him over the head with a hammer and puts all his body parts in little bottles on the shelf. So he's all very neat. So cute. Uh, that, that, yeah, lovely. <laughs> and I personally believe the start, the first story in Tales of the Crypt uh, is the most Christmassy thing ever, right up to the bit where the wife kills the husband of the poker. Lovely. <laughs> but, well, you ruined the so, ending, uh, yeah. Dave, but okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's only the beginning. It gets much worse. Everyone always dies <laughs> in these things. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, Vault of Horror, uh, Tales of the Crypt, and From Beyond the Grave. That's, that's my choices. Okay. And my three are, it's a weird thing, you know, because I'm a, obviously, the things that me and Dave write about, the things that I'm obsessed about, I'm a massive horror obsessive, and I've been since it was, since I can remember, like all through the 80s, I was just, I'm massively into video nasties and gore. I still obsess over horror. Don't celebrate Halloween at all. At all. <laughs> it means nothing to me. It meant nothing in this country until the 90s. We, it was like one day where you'd kind of, you'd have a bit of horror themed stuff on kids' telly. And we'd have How is that traditions. different from any of the other days, it sounds like? <laughs> well, yeah, but we didn't have Trick, trick or Treat, wasn't a thing. Trick or Treat was something we saw in American films. Mm -hmm. But my spooky season is Christmas. That's mm -hmm. when I put the ghost stories on. That was the tradition in Britain was ghost films and horror films would be on at Christmas. And I still feel that. But I still feel a kind of Halloween vibes. And I do put a bit of a film on every year. And my three choices for Halloween is the same era as Dave's choices. There's a film from the early 70s called Theatre of Blood, which is incredible. And it's got the same feel as... Dave's three choices. It's Vincent Price is magnificent. He plays a um, Shakespearean actor who's very up his own ass, who's basically been belittled by a group of theatre critics, and he goes mad and decides to get his revenge on all these critics by killing them one by one in Shakespearean ways. So one of them, he literally takes the pound of flesh and removes the heart from them and and he's sending them to the rest of the critics. It's the perfect mixture of utter horror and the darkest black comedy. It's hilarious. And, but when I was a kid, it terrified the life out of me. Just wonderful film. The second one is my favourite horror film of all time, which is Hellraiser, mm. by Barker's film from 1987. I was obsessed with horror. And the 80s is the decade when it became a bit cute and cuddly and safe. And you had things like Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees and Chucky, all these cute horror mascots that were taking over multiplexes. And Hellraiser comes along in 1987 and reminds everyone that horror is horrible. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it in my life. This kind of hooks ripping through flesh and kind of these leather clad demons with pale faces mm. kind of become through a, a, a mystery box. It's just a stunning, beautiful film. Third choice was actually a Halloween, I wouldn't say a prank, it was a Halloween one-off play that was transmitted in 1992 in Britain. And we choose it as the end of the Scarred for Life era. It's called Ghost Watch. And it was presented as a, a real live transmission from an actual haunted house in London. So you had 
what were household names in Britain? A guy called Michael Parkinson, um, Sarah Green, Mike Smith, a comedian called an actor called um, Craig, Charles. Craig Charles. These were all trusted trusted faces on British television. Loads of people missed the first ten minutes, including myself. I was in university. Half the country was completely fooled by this mm -hmm. transmission. So there's a ghost called Mr. Pipes that's haunting in the entire house that people see and they, in kind of the background. It is incredible, an incredible piece of drama transmitted on Halloween that fooled the nation and petrified the nation. There was, again, there was questions asked in the Houses of Parliament over whether this is suitable because the BBC was flooded with complaints. Mm -hmm. There's a dark twist to this story because a few days later, a lad with learning difficulties, unfortunately, he thought the whole thing was real and the demons were going to possess him. So he took his own life. The BBC have mm. never repeated it. Mm. It's, a, it's unavailable on Blu-ray and DVD, but it still has this notorious reputation in Britain. Every year on Twitter, there's a ghost watch watch along where people put it on DVD and they tweet along to it. <sighs> but it's, it's an incredible piece of drama. Stunning. Perfect Halloween deal. Perfect Halloween or Christmas. Yeah, that sounds very Christmas, War yeah. of the Worlds. Uh, I'm sure Definitely. you guys are familiar with that. <laughs> All right, well, we've gone yeah. a little bit over the hour. You gave us your top picks, so we have a lot of work to do over here for Halloween. I hope that you guys will still, you can start it over there. That can be an extension of Scarred for Life is doing some trick-or-treating. It sounds like you've got the snacks and everything <laughs> even for it. So thank you, everybody, yeah. for joining us. Uh, Dave and Steven, thank you so much. This was so insightful and really interesting. I've also learned that we have very different definitions of cute and beautiful and things like that and that's great and cozy yeah and cozy and cozy yeah but thank you guys so much i dropped your twitter in the chat scarred for life too you can find them on twitter and how do they find you on facebook just scarred for life search on facebook scarred as well. life. i think scarred for life books i think it's called yeah okay yeah. scarred for life books on facebook use uh scarred 15 all caps if you would like to buy volume one or two before volume three drops um do you guys have any uh any comments to leave us with or any lasting thoughts before we sign off or oh, guess the podcast Give oh the yes podcast yeah it's if you yeah. want to hear what different celebrities make of all this stuff it's we're having a blast absolute blast yeah uh, yeah uh, I, I would say anybody thinking of writing a book just do it and get really yeah. involved yeah. they're brilliant they've been brilliant chelsea's been brilliant with us uh and we've had we, we've had an amazing time with it as, as, as Steve said earlier on it's changed our lives yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been my pleasure, Lulu's pleasure. And I will say personally, you guys are an inspiration to me. Just it's kind of seeing how this has gone and just the trajectory that you all have been on. So I look forward to hearing more. I wish you all the success. You guys definitely deserve it. You worked so hard. And I hope that you have a very spooky or beautiful, co cute and cozy Halloween <laughs> and Christmas. And thank you guys so much. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much for your time. And we will see you, you. next time. Oh, Bye, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.